In fact, we talked about the foundation of inquiries. But I should say the foundation for the second phase of my career came through inquiries. Once Professor U. R. Rao was mentioning in a function where people who completed certain period of service were being felicitated. He said when a coin goes in circulation and come back, it would have lost the shine. But rag came back with more shine. And that's because of incoins. And thank you, especially the young colleagues who were part and parcel of that team in the formative years. I also should place on record the services of a few individuals who thought about this institution, who nurtured it, who were part and parcel of bringing it to this level. There is a Dr. Muthunayakam, you would have seen his name in his tone, near the guest house. He was a person who believed that rather than being a funding department, Department of Ocean Development should own institutions. And that's the reason INCOIS was registered in 1999 as an institution. We had at that time Dr. Narendra Nath, who was holding this baby while he was part of National Remonstrance in Agency. Then came Dr. Harsha Gupta, was a great person, you must be knowing him professionally. In fact, he is the guiding spirit behind what Incoins is today. And who in fact changed me from a non-campus lover to a campus lover. And that's why today you have this great campus. We also had Dr. Goyal, another product of space, and Dr. Shailesh Naik. And today, you have again Dr. Rajivan and Dr. Shanai to guide the entire activity. We have a continuity. We have a continuity of thought. Essentially, that thought is revolving around two sides of a coin, that is science and service. I believe, even today I believe, that a publicly funded institution has the right to exist only if its presence can make a difference for the country, the taxpayers. That's the fundamental axiom on which INCOIS was built, and the focus, and the service, the team spirit, the oneness that is present even physically, in conceptualizing this building in contrast to several institutions that you could see in this country and elsewhere. You have done that. And without science, high quality science and thoughts, service will be stayed. And that's what is seen in the way you have developed and I'm extremely happy you have even PhD students working in this place. I left this place in 2005 and I used to come once in a while here and also report what I have been doing. Once I came here after Chandrayaan and told what I did as director of ESSC. Later I talked about satellite oceanography, also the Mars orbital mission. Today I thought I will talk to you different subject, the one that is talked about in this country as a very major new step forward in space research, science and technology. That's about the human space flight. But it's not limited to ISRO or India. It's what the humanity is today trying to achieve. They have been at it, but now there is a renewed interest and there is a great progress taking place 
and more importantly, it's a collective process of humanity cutting across the national boundaries. And what you see in the next slide, can I just Who is Kajori? Ah, okay. If you look at the right hand top corner, what is happening in the world today is 15 major space agencies of the world got together collectively for the last four or five years and prepared a global exploration roadmap. In January 2018, that final roadmap was published. It's available in the net. You can look at it. There's a paradigm change once upon a time. This was an arena for competition, one of manship between <coughs> two countries in the bipolar world, others joined. But today, humanity is looking at the universe as one entity, putting together all their strengths and trying to see how you look at this outer space, which goes above 120 kilometers above the Earth to the limits of the limitless universe. And that is one major part of it. If you look at the elements of that, it starts with what is happening today in the International Space Station, which is a joint effort, joint venture of a few countries who build it, and several countries who are participating in that action, which is there in the orbit right from the year 2001, and which is going to be there at least for another five years. So that's a starting point of collective exploration with human beings. The next step forward is to go towards moon, towards asteroids, towards <coughs> Mars. There are also people talking about human habitat and even township in Mars in the next hundred years. That's the kind of dream that people are having. Between this dream and today's reality, several things are going to happen in the next few decades. But if you look at the human presence in solar system, along with the robots which would help these human beings to do this job effectively, there are several challenges one has to go through. And people from ocean are also used to this instead of going to the outer space, you go deep into the sea. You have human beings in pressure vessels, equipped vessels, getting down to the deep sea, conducting explorations, being controlled, again from the ground stations on Earth. At the end of this lecture, you will find there are several commonalities, challenges between going to the space and going to the sea with the human beings. Today, when you talk about the space, there are nearly 65 countries engaged in it. India is one among the few who are the front-ranking countries. You have US, Russia, the European Space Agency, which is a collection, the consortium of a few countries, then Japan, China, India, then comes Canada, Brazil, etc. Et Some of them have capability to launch out of this HD A few of them have ability to build spacecraft. Many of them are operators of spacecraft for several applications like communication, remote sensing. And there are a large number, a few thousands, who are engaged in downstream services using these systems. But if you look at those who are engaged in the human presence in solar system, who have that ability to launch the pursue an aggressive program, there are only very few. 
US and the Soviets or Russia are the forerunners in the system followed by China who is going in aggressive manner. International Space Station brought a few more operators like Japan, Canada, Europe, etc. into that. And today, India is one country which has been going strong on this activity. Just to recall in the year 2006, India presented to the scientific community what we could do in this area. And certainly it is a point of inflection from the satellite rocket systems to the lunar exploration and to the human space flight. We also had several critical technologies we had to look at and some of them we have wetted our hands. I will talk about it as and when the time comes. But if you look at there are three regimes here, the bigger one is related to Earth. If you want to put a human being around uh, in an orbit, keep them there safely, bring them back safely, what are the technologies one has to go through? Further, if you want to go to the vicinity of Moon and to the vicinity of Mars, Mars, what all one should encounter. Apart from those new issues, even for these existing ones, there are more and more challenges as we look at Moon and Mars. What India is today planning to do through Gaganya is to put three human beings around Earth in a low Earth orbit, keep them for a week and then bring back them safely to a point in Bay of Bengal or APMC. That's the first part of it. You have seen the rockets taking off with spacecrafts. We also saw how we went with the Chandrayaan orbit, Mangalyaan orbit. And what is going to happen is to put a lander in Moon. But when you talk about a human being to be put, the most important part is the bottom line. It involves human beings whom we call crew members, people who are agile, who are alert, who are fit to travel, go through the kinds of accelerations, vibrations, the initial trauma of the takeoff in a rocket. Conduct what is required to navigate the craft in which they travel and be there. And when you have crew members there, it involves the cabin in which you have to provide the environment required for the members to be there, the life support systems required for keeping them, and then the consumables that are required for the entire period of the journey. And if you look at the environment, what you have to provide in that cabin relates to the pressure, relates to the constituent elements, oxygen, etc. The storage of oxygen, the removal of carbon dioxide, temperature, humidity control, how you remove order from there. What's the kind of suit required for operations within the cabin and outside the cabin? What kind of protection system is required when the time of landing, when you get into water, get into a jungle, etc., etc. All these things are part and parcel of that system. When you have a human being in space, he or she goes through a microgravity environment. You would have heard what Kalpana Chawla or Sunida Williams or any astronaut for that matter goes through and what one has to go through before in the process of preparation and also what happens to them after they come back. There are issues physiological, happening to the entire flow, eyes, 
bones, immunity. There are psychological issues that they go through. One has to get prepared. And the life of the crew members. And they need to operate a craft in any given contingency situation. So that's the kind of challenge on these people. And the preparation is something like two to three years to go through this physical environment and psychological environment. So that is one element of that. The second element of it is you have to lift this entire mass. And what is involved in that? Today, we are talking about a three-member crew and that would be about 10 tons. That mass to be lifted to a lower earth orbit like 200 or 300 kilometers above the earth, which can be done by our GSL, the Mars 3 heaviest vehicle. And when you go to Mars or Moon and you have to come back, you have to carry all that is required to manage this entire process. If you have to bring a three-member crew with even some of the resources excavated from these planets back to Earth, let us say it is 10 tons, the launch vehicle must have a capability to lift 250 tons in the middle of Earth orbit. I am talking about GSLD Mark 3 with 10 ton to you. And in such a situation what we require is 250 ton to you. What the world has today is the famous Elon Musk Fat and Heavy which can take about 65 tons to you. What US is now building, the space launch system which is 70 to 130 ton to Leo. So there is a very major challenge even in having a vehicle of the capacity. Today we talk about a PSLE which has done 44 flights and 42 are successful reliable rockets. But if you have to use a rocket to put a human being in it and carry it, we talk about a reliability of 0.98 or 0.99. That means effectively one or two failures in 100 can be tolerated. This has to be built up through the pedigree of the system, subsystem, design, etc. etc. So that is a challenge. Must have a reliable launch vehicle system. When you come in an aircraft, there is an aircraft design built certified by a federal aviation agency, check every day before, and that's where we travel. Now think of these human beings who have to travel in a rocket which is assembled on the launch patch over a couple of months. The one which could not be tested except for some electrical aspects of it. But the confidence has to come through the design, the redundancies, etc., etc., etc. So this is one major challenge of building a launch vehicle for human transport. It's called human-rated launch vehicle. As you go up, it can fail. But what is more important is, would we have ability to sense that possible failure a few minutes in advance and like the aircraft seat ejection system which you would have read in newspapers even the last couple of days can these crew members be ejected moved to a safer space again using rockets crew escape system with a very higher level of reliability we did a test of that in the year 2018 from Sri Lanka. We were successful. So this is one very major aspect. As you go to the orbit, are we able to save the crew members in the event of any disaster taking place to the launch vehicle? 
One has to navigate to the right orbit. And one has to pack. And when the human being is in the orbit, you would like to communicate and find out the state of health of the craft and the individuals. If possible, 24 by 7 basis. If not, at least through periodic checks. That means, literally you must have systems equipped to monitor the health. That is physical aspect of it. Second one is navigating to the right place. Navigating to an orbit around Earth is rather easy. But when we talk about navigating towards Moon, navigating towards Mars, it's a very complex job. When you talk about Mars, we talk about a distance of nearly 660 million kilometers. And at the end of the travels, we should be able to be there within a small pillbox of plus minus 50 kilometers. And we should be able to ascertain that well in advance of 300 days before the travel. That's the kind of navigation accuracy is to understand the impact of other celestial bodies on the craft that we are going to have. Ability to track objects at that distance from the ground stations, therefore the deep space ground station networks. So this is one aspect of it. But it is mathematics, it is electronics. Now comes the re-entry part of it. We talk about a altitude of 100 to 120 kilometers. As the craft comes back to Earth, it encounters atmospheric pressures, dense atmosphere, terrific amount of heat will be generated, thermal fluxes of high order produced and consumed. The effect is craft and the people system inside will get heated up. How do you protect it? That is another element. ISRO, India conducted two experiments, one in 2007, one in 2014, and you were successful in doing that. That is one step. Last one is landing, precise landing. If you are landing in ocean, there is a better situation for us. But if you have to land on the Surface like space shuttle, it is like an aircraft landing there. That's an involved task. But when you land on moon, when you land on Mars, the job is really tricky. We are going to have an experiment soon, that is Chandrayaan 2, putting a lander and rover and moon. Just to compare the complexity, let me use an example. When you travel in an aircraft, it goes at about 800 kilometers per hour speed. You land in an airport which is well laid out with good infrastructure and support. And the pilot is trained, navigator is trained how to be there precisely in any kind of weather. Imagine a An Air Force pilot, he goes at faster speeds, maybe 2,500 kilometers per hour. They have to land in terrains which are clumsy, in difficult terrains, like in Himalayas. But they are trained, place is known, it is simulated with virtual reality, and they land there. Imagine you have to do that in Moon. That's what you are going to do in Chandrayaan 2 with an unmanned craft. It goes at about 6,000 kilometers per hour. You have to break it for soft landing to almost zero. You know approximately where on moon you are going to land. It is like saying that I am coming to Telangana or Andhra Pradesh or Deccan Plateau. But where exactly you have to land? 
and where the four legs of that craft would sit and what would be the kind of ups and downs there. It has to be sensed by the craft and based on that information processed there, it has to steer itself and land smoothly and if you don't land smoothly, it will topple. That's the kind of engineering system that ought to be built in an unmanned craft. Imagine that craft carries human beings by landing on earth. You have seen recently the Curiosity lantern getting into Mars and recently the Insight getting into Mars. They were successful. But the kind of complexity that you go through in landing on a surface of Mars was very clearly seen. But when you go to Mars, which is possible only once in 26 months, when you go, you have to come back also at that time only. It requires 1,000 days minimum for a travel. That means a space endurance of 1,000 days plus is essential if you have to travel. And imagine if you have to live there. Imagine if you have to carry all this material to the planet Mars. That is the challenge. And today, the record available for humanity is one year of living in International Space Station. 365 days. That's all available. So one has to create that Martian environment on Earth and put people through that dream. Do we carry all this material from Earth to Mars? And we have a limitation if final mass is 10 ton coming back to Earth, we have to take 250 ton from Earth. That means a rocket which is of 2,500 or 3,000 tons mass. No, people are talking about whether you can use the in-situ resources in Mars or more to build things there. So it's a totally new field. And these are all the things that you have to go through physically. Then there is a question of radiation. When you put a human being around that, you don't go through that process. But as you go through the Van Allen belt, oh, and then the galactic cosmic rays, the ions that would affect the craft, the solar activity in once in 11 years of cycle, there are at least one or two events that are going to create problem. How do you protect the craft? How do you protect the systems? How do you protect the people from this radiation? But these are all the challenges one has to go through. And finally, for what can we not do this with robots? The solution is a judicious mix of robots and human beings. Those who are in observation, those who are in surveys and ocean of land, you always talk about the judicious mix of in situ measurements and what you get from the satellite system. Here too, it's the judicious mix of putting robots and then putting the human. The human has the cognitive ability, ability to decide in situ what further to be done. Whereas a robot can do what it is programmed to do. The robot is easy to carry and bring back, but the human being is not that way. So now the direction is whether some of these cognitive decision making abilities of the human being can be built around these robots either for real-time decision-making or for a delayed decision-making <coughs> process. And these days people talk about brain-inspired robots. People talk about the use of augmented reality to enhance the ability of the human beings as well as the robots. So these are all the directions in which things are going to happen. <coughs> now as I told in the beginning, as people who are in the field of ocean, think of what are the challenges and what you can learn, what you can adapt to the deep sea exploration in the future. I will stop at this moment, maybe another 10 minutes we can take. I would like to leave this campus maybe around 4.30 because yesterday I got a call saying that my flight scheduled at 9.15 is cancelled. 
I had to go for a plan B. The plan B is I have to leave by the 7.15 flight. That's the constraint. Okay. Any questions? Two or three? There is a thinking in that direction with the current or the classical propulsion systems that we have and the kind of trajectories that we follow that is going around the sun and then capturing thousand days is essential. So people are now talking about the propulsion systems which should use the capabilities of light for example. But I would say today they are in the fictional stage. The reality is in the near future we have to depend on what is the conventional. In space, one thing is the pedigree, you require liability of the transportation system. of Shakti. First one happened in the 80s and the second one is the recent Kalpana Chaudhasa. The first accident happened because there was a leak in the solid matter. There was a rubber material and the simple fact that rubber will become brittle at low temperature was probably not noticed. And the test process also it didn't get through. Finally it required the great physicist Feynman to find it out from an automobile workshop and then incorporate. We are all aware of it now. If you look at Kalpana's Chavra's issue, it is related to the thermal protection system. Okay. The solution to that is, if you are able to do the preparation of the vehicle properly, go through the entire process, yes, that is number one. In spite of all that, if you are able to monitor the health, the condition of the craft, which is available to the ground controllers, which is available to the people who are inside it, things would become better. Hypothetically, if there was a problem while taking off and a part of the thermal protection system flew away, that was a problem for Kalpana Chawla. One could have aborted that mission rather than going into the orbit, would have been a suborbital flight and brought the crew members safely back. But that information was not available. So I talked about the augmented reality. Today what is being built in US is an augmented reality to understand the health of the craft. <coughs> understand. Like you know the patient is there, all patients information is available to you through the augmented reality. In space shuttle today, they use that augmented reality from 2015, it is there. So these are some of the developments, but we learn from experience and put it. But nothing can substitute the kind of care you take in design, in manufacturing, in testing, in establishing the possible failure modes and stopping them on the ground before taking. There are two schools of thought. 
saying that we should first attempt and there is a school of thought that we will never be able to reach. Both are there. So we are yet to understand what is involved. We are not going to go around in mass because that is not the environment. We have to live within a module at mass. That is what is talked about. Even when you talk about moon, that is the kind of situation with the kind of atmosphere which is absent in moon. Kind of atmosphere which is in Mars, which is not conducive for you to you, you don't have the oxygen there. It is actually inverse, oxygen and other elements. So it is only living within containers, and people are designing such containers. How practical it is to carry all this from here? It is the task. Let me also, as people are speaking today, or dreaming today, can we get those resources from asteroids rather than carrying it all the way from Earth? Because carrying that itself is a difficult job. But dreams will become fiction, fiction become practice, maybe in the foreseeable future. Mars is having like water on its planet. People are like, I heard from NASA that they are going to move towards Mars if Earth is finished with water. Is that rock or like I'm asking? See, when you say water molecules on moon are likely signs of water through the channels that they are seeing, it's a question of paleoclimatology. That means that maybe billions of years ago, probably, there would have been water, this is the kind of thing. So one direction of research is, if it can happen in Mars, will it happen in Earth? Number one. Whatever people are talking about water in Mars is because of the physical features as they have captured from ground stations. That's all. They think it is like the reverse that we see here. Nothing more. There is no other sign today. And there is no sign today that even that life existed there. Because we say if life existed, there has to be the presence of methane, etc. Biogeny. We have no confirmation as of now. So these are the kinds of problems people are looking at in time scales of this billion years at the moment. What we have in moon is called water ice. In the temperature profile, if you take on moon, as there is no atmosphere, so either very negative or very positive. So in some trenches, probably there may be water ice, but no ice, water as liquid air, or water molecules, that's all. So I don't think we can talk about that water as a life-sustaining system on Mars or moon today. And if you look at the atmosphere, what you look at is oxygen. That oxygen that is to be created there, actually. That is through a big process in the future. But the point is, they are nearest neighbors and they may give some clue to even the origin of life on Earth and possibly the way these planets So don't plan to live there in your <laughs> lifetime, probably. Or like you do in the Earth. Maybe you can go there, live in a module, and then come back. It's possible. Yeah. Any other words? One more last question. This time for 